Okay. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, I'm Ed, AE7TE, some of you talked to me before, so you have not. Um, I'm here today to talk about electron tubes. So why am I talking about electron tubes? You can get a bag full of IRF 510s and build yourself a transmitter. And IRF 510s are much more inexpensive than tubes. Uh, some people, there's a nostalgia factor about tubes. Um, some people like that they're simple. With an IRF 510 transmitter, I have to put in a safety network to make sure high SWR doesn't blow the final, which it'll do in a second. Uh, tubes have a little more leeway. They're a little more sturdy electrically. Uh, they can survive momentary overloads. Some, uh, it's easier way to get a lot of high power. You have two, someone said four or 400 tubes. I think that was what they were. I don't remember exactly what the guy's website said, but two tubes get you 1,500 watts. Um, with a IRF 510 transmitter, you need like a bank of 16, combiner, transformer, heat sink, um, overridge protection, so forth. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to cover mainly tube safeties, do's and don'ts. Tubes are different than transistors in solid state and they have to be treated with respect. Uh, fundamentals, how they work, tubes and audio. Um, a lot of people that are in the hi-fi community like to use tubes because they feel that they have a better, more pure sound, warmer, uh, more musical. There's a million different words that people use to describe the tube sound. Uh, but as for the radio, tubes can be used in the uh, receiving sections and um, tweaked to be a good receiver amplifier. Tubes and transmitting. Um, again, I said that a tube transmitter is much more simple than a solid state transmitter. There's a lot less parts. You can get a higher power with less circuit simple, uh, complexity. Uh, tubes and receiving. They used to make a, a bunch of tube receivers that were all tubes. Not so much anymore because they can do that with a solid state. They don't need the high power and the benefits of tubes. Um, I was working on a seven tube receiver project for a while, but that's kind of fallen to the wayside. Uh, question graphs and complaints. If anyone brought any rotten tomatoes, that would be the time to throw them. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, a lot of the older radios used 90 volts to operate. The uh, farm radios, they charge a battery, um, a big battery about the size of a brick. And 90 volts is good for small receivers and low output power. Um, the tubes need a higher charge to operate because you're sucking electrons through a vacuum. Um, transmitters, on the other hand, use a lot more voltage. Uh, 300 volts for a small one tube transmitter up to 3,000 volts for something like this monstrosity you see in the background. Um, you have to treat these voltages with respect because when you touch them, they're very, very seldom is there a second chance. Uh, in 2011, I was building a guitar amp, and the guitar amp's main power supply had a 400 volt power. So I was troubleshooting an oscillation problem. I had a little capacitor in my hand where I was injecting into different parts of the circuit power it off, test it, see if it removed the oscillation, power it back off again. What happened was I had suspected that my capacitor was shorted. Grabbed my multimeter, set it on the resistance, touched the leads of the capacitor, got bit by 400 volts. It felt like the truck that hit me got hit by a truck. So you do not want to screw around with higher voltages like that because I was very lucky that I got a second chance. Some people don't. Okay. One of the main rules you have to work with is that power transformer from the two amplifier is going to be putting off five or six hundred volts AC, which gets turned into DC by the rectifier bank. So the best way to be safe in working with tubes is to have the AC cord unplugged anytime you're inside with your hands inside the chassis. Because again, that AC voltage is very unforgiving. Um, the capacitors will hold the charge, 3, 4, 5, 600 volts, 2,000 volts, however you have your transmitter. So you need to make sure that there's some means in place to discharge those capacitors before you reach inside there. Because again, those capacitors will kick you. I felt it and it hurts. Um, what some people will do is they'll get a long copper rod and insulate it with a piece of wood or plexiglass. And they'll insert a uh, low resistance in there, let's say 400 ohms. And it'll be a high wattage, so it can take the beating of the high voltage. But 400 ohms, clip the uh, one side of the probe to ground and touch the other probe to the capacitors. It'll bleed off the charge in a few seconds. The resistor will absorb all that heat, and you will not have the problem of working around charged capacitors. 
Whereas in a 12 volt circuit, like an IRF 510 transmitter, let's say 28 volt power supply, you can touch your finger across the 28 volts and you might feel a little tingle. As long as your skin is dry and you don't have any open wounds or anything for the metal to contact, you shouldn't have to worry too much about the electricity. However, tubes are much more dangerous. Next slide, please. Okay, in addition, tubes heat up. Transistors heat up too, but that's a byproduct of their operation. We have the big, thin heat sinks to take away, take away the heat. And tubes, they have to get hot to work. I built a stereo once using a tube called 6SN7. It's a dual triode tube, two operating devices in one little glass envelope. There was a biasing problem with the negative voltage that goes on the grids, and it wasn't receiving the right voltage, so the tube was overheating. I could see the little plates inside getting dull red. So I reached over for a two, uh, tool to tweak the problem into place, and my elbow touched the envelope of the plates. I think that day I invented some new swear words. Um, some of the higher power tubes, like the 4400, uh, 833 alpha, 813, their envelopes get so hot just from their normal operation that you have to have a steady stream of cooling air flowing over the valve, or the glass seals where the metal leads come in will fail because the different co what is it called different coefficient of expansion the metal will expand one way the glass will expand a different way it'll open up that seal your tube's done some of them are so powerful that even the filament running you have to have a cooling air flowing over them they have a glass chimney that'll fit over the tube air goes around the chimney the chimney directs the air where it needs to go that's what these things are here they connect to the chimney the air flows in those holes, out those holes, and it cools the leads. Again, touch the glass, you'll have a bad day. Next, please. Okay. Tube transformers are heavy. Tubes themselves are not so much. Um, the high voltage transformers, especially when you get above 5 to 10 watts of power, um, the tuning networks, big massive capacitors, one gentleman had a capacitor around here that could be used in a tuning network. Uh, shielding, a lot of these transmitters have cages. A lot of metal, a lot of glass, a lot of parts that go into one small package make a transmitter that's going to be somewhat heavy. So if you're not someone that lifts weights, heavy, uh, heavy weights occasionally, then you may want to ask for some help when you're moving your rig. That's what they call them boat anchors. They don't call them boat anchors for nothing. when you're working with the hybrid. Like, I have a Yaesu FT-101 double E, and it uses solid state for everything except the final amplifier, which is a 12BY7 driver and two 6JS6C final amplifiers. When you work with tubes and transistors together, you have to make sure that you have the protection and the inputs and the outputs. For example, you have to have a capacitor on any input or output to that tube amplifier because if there's any DC voltage that comes out of that tube amplifier, it's going to be so high that your transistors won't have a chance. They won't even know what hit them. Most transistors are designed to work with a maximum of 30 to 45 volts. If they get with 120 volts, then they're done. Next, please. Okay, this is the anatomy of a tube. You've got a glass envelope. Sometimes they're made of metal. There's advantages and disadvantages to metal and glass tubes. Uh, the reason that they're, most of them are glass is because it was economy of scale. It's cheaper to manufacture a glass tube than it would be a metal tube. Um, let's see. The filament is the driving element of the tube. It's what gets hot. You run a current through it just like a light bulb. It gets hot, emits electrons. Or it heats up a cathode, which is a sleeve that goes around the filament, and it heats up and emits electrons. It's called the Edison effect. When it gets hot, the electrons boil to the surface, they can be taken off. We do that by using the plate. The plate is charged to a high voltage, 90, 30, no, not 30, 300, 150, 4,000, whatever, and it sucks those electrons away from the cathode. And because there's no atoms in the way, because it's a vacuum, it can do that very easily. We have a triode over here, which is the same as a diode, except that we've inserted a screen in between the cathode and the anode, or the plate. And what the screen does is it allows us to control that electron stream with a small charge. 
if you put a negative charge on the screen, it'll put a field around those wires, and those, that field will cut off the stream of electrons. If you put a high enough negative voltage on there, it'll cut it off completely. So you can control a large power through the tube using a small charge. Next, please. Okay, the effect is called the Edison effect. When the electrons boil to the surface, they are free to be pulled off by that red hot electrode. Um, I've actually seen a guy do experiments with something called a flame triode. Instead of having a glass envelope with a vacuum, he sits there with a torch and heats up a end of a paper clip. Then he puts a, another paper clip next to it and it's charged to, I think, 400 volts. And he's got a little current meter and he shows that current is flowing from the red hot, red hot paper clip to the charged paper clip. And the current's actually flowing through the fire. They used to call these the different supply voltages. We really have gotten away from that with our transistor uh, circuitry, but the A supply is the heater voltage, heats up the tubes. A lot of current, low voltage. Um, I've used tubes as low as two and a half volts. I've used tubes as high as 12, 15 volts. Uh, in the TV era, you'd have a lot of tubes with weird voltages because they'd put them in strings and the voltages would have to all add up to 120. But most uh, tubes you see are six or 12 volts to heat them up at various currents. The B supply is what we call the high voltage supply. Um, receivers 150 to 200 volts. You don't need a whole lot because you're not getting a lot of power. You're just taking the energy from the air, amplifying it, and then driving a speaker with it. Uh, transmitters more because um, I think, say, a 6146 Bravo would take 700 volts to get the full 100 watts out of them, the pair. So you need a lot of voltage because you're basically pulling electrons out of a red hot cathode, but it doesn't take a lot of current because only so much current can flow through that vacuum. The C supply, they call it the bias voltage, is the voltage that you put on the grid, and the grid will control that current. Um, that's not the signal coming into the grid, that's going to be the standing DC voltage on the grid that will control, like set the bias point, and once you have that bias point, you can set how the tube operates. Slide, please. Okay. Diodes just have the plate and the cathode. And they can be used to rectify and they can also be used to detect radio signals. Um, basically, if you have the red hot cathode in there, you can increase the plate voltage and the cathode will just put out more and more electrons until it gets to another point, which is pretty much called saturation. And saturation is when the cathode can't put any more electrons out no matter how much more you increase the voltage. And again, they have a heating filament, which is the directly heated cathode, which is the tungsten wire that's in there is the radiating or the emitting element. And the indirectly heated filament is where the tungsten wire heats a cathode, which is a sleeve and it's got some sort of coating on it that makes the um, emissive properties of the sleeve higher basically can put out more current without as much power being put into it. Uh, when they put a, the screen grid in between the cathode and the plate, they created a triode. These work like JFETs. Uh, if anyone's ever built a circuit with an MPF-102, like a simple preamplifier and so forth, uh, JFETs work pretty much like triodes. Kind of a mix between triodes and pentodes. But um, you have the grid, which is charged to a negative voltage, it takes very little to no power from the circuit that drives it. So that's how you can make such efficient receivers because it takes very little power from the resonant tank that's tuning your station. Okay, then they put in a, another screen grid and they call it a tetrode. Tetrode means that there's four elements. The screen grid doesn't have an AC signal on it. The screen grid is charged to a high voltage near what the plate voltage is charged to. What this does is it accelerates the electron field that comes from the cathode to the plate. So you get a lot more power gain out of the same tube because that screen grid is basically accelerating the, excuse me, accelerating the electrons. So you drive the first screen grid and then you charge the second screen grid. Next, please. Okay. Secondary emission happened because the screen grid was accelerating the electrons so fast that the electrons would hit the plate and bounce off and be sucked back into the screen. This would cause the screen to heat up. The screen got higher, hotter and hotter 
it would do this more and more until eventually the tube would just burn out. The screen would physically melt. Um, it would lower the gain. And also there was something called the negative resistance region too, where if you had a higher plate voltage, you, it would, what's the word I'm thinking of? A higher plate voltage would result in a lower current. And they would actually build oscillators called, uh, out of them, they called them dynatron oscillators because a tetra was also called a dynatron. <laughs> so they had to do something about this because it was destroying tubes and it was creating unattended side effects. Next, please. See right here, this region right here is the negative resistance region because the x-axis is a plate voltage and as you're increasing the plate voltage then you see that the current starts getting higher Then at this point the current actually starts getting lower until it gets here and then it just extremely increases again. So when you wanted to build a dynatron oscillator you would bias the tube to where it was conducting somewhere in this region and you put that across a series tuned circuit and it would cancel out resistances in the circuit and make an oscillator. And I've seen guys do this with something like a scrap of galvanized sheet metal because they can make that have a negative resistance region just like the uh, tube. Okay, pentode is the same thing as a tetrode but it has a fifth, grid, uh, fifth element in there. And the third screen grid is called a suppressor. Um, they usually tie this to the cathode of the tube or another low voltage that's lower than the plate. And what this does is it takes, it creates a field around the plate so when those secondary emission electrons come through there and they hit the plate and bounce off, that electric field near the plate will repel them back to the plate and they won't go into the screen. <coughs> this causes them to all go into the plate, the screen grid's not heating up, everyone's happy. Pintos have really good performance at RF because that high charged screen grid is going to shield the input from the output and the capacitance will be broken up, it'll be lower. Um, pentodes don't have a problem with oscillating as much as triodes do because that capacitance is broken up. Sometimes they still have to be neutralized but that's all depending on the amplifier, the amount of power, the particular tube you're using. Next please. Okay, so I talked about putting an AC signal on the screen grid. First grid will control the conduction of the tube. It's the closest to the cathode, its field has the most effect on the electron stream. So that's where we want to put our AC voltage. Um, basically what it does is it turns on and off the stream that goes to the tube and it'll impose that AC signal on the plate, but at a higher amplitude. So you're basically taking a voltage and turning it into a current change. Then what we have to do to actually turn that current change back into a usable signal is put something between the tube and the power supply. Uh, for audio usually we use a resistor. For RF it's usually a coil of some sort. Sometimes they tune it to a certain frequency, sometimes they don't. And the coil or the resistor will turn that changing current to a changing voltage. So if I put two millivolts onto the grid of that tube, then I might say 15 volts out at the plate. So, next please. Okay, we have amplification factor. Amplification factor is something like the raw gain. Under ideal conditions, this is the maximum gain that particular tube will have. <laughs> problem is, is we can never take that value and just say, oh, well, that's the gain of the tube. Because when you factor in the amplification factor with the plate resistance and the circuit elements that are outside the tube, you get something that's a little lower. For example, a 12AX7 is a dual triode for audio use. They use them a lot in guitar amplifiers and microphone. Um, the amplification factor for that triode is 100, but the maximum gain you usually get out of that is closer to 50 to 60. It all depends on the plate voltage that you use, the resistors that you use to bias the tube, and the amount of, the amount of, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? I don't know, I'll get to that later. Transconductance. Transconductance is like milliamps per volt, is the way you should think of it. If I put a change of one millivolt on that tube, and the 
conductance, the tube changes by one milliamp, then I can use those formulas to find out what the transconductance is. So I can use that to find out how much gain that tube is going to give me because I can see how much control that grit has over the current stream. Plate resistance is another element that is going to be useful in finding out the gain of the tube. It's like how, how resistant the plate is and changes the voltage when it affects the current stream. Um, why this is important is you'll have that AC voltage that's being amplified on the plate. So you'll have an AC wave changing the plate voltage. If it has a low plate resistance, its own output signal is going to be changing its conductance and therefore it's going to be feeding itself back. If you have a higher plate resistance, it's going to be conducting the same amount for changing voltage, so it'll have a higher gain and have less instability problems. Next, please. Okay, we have small and large signal amplifiers. Usually small signals are coupled to each other. You'll have RF amplifier coupled to a mixer, coupled to an IF amplifier, coupled to a detector. Those are small signals. They take 40 microvolts out of the air, convert it into a higher power that can be driven through a filter, chop out the sideband or chop out the frequencies you don't want, um, and hand it over to another tube for more amplification. Usually when you have a large signal amplifier, it's to drive either a speaker or an antenna or a mirror, mirror, meter, sorry. Um, it's used to drive a load. Sometimes the load is a DC load, like for example you have a series pass regulator in a tube power supply. So that load for that amplifier is going to be a DC load, like a resistor or a transmitter. So tubes and audio. Again, a lot of audio files feel, think that tubes have a sound that's can't be reproduced by transistors and uh, ICs. Whether it is or not, it's not really part of this discussion. Um, some people feel and they're entitled to feel whichever they want. Um, audio range is 20 to 20,000 hertz for hi-fi uses. That's Most people, especially when you're older than about the age of 18, you can't hear up into the upper region around 20,000 hertz. Uh, I've tested my own hearing. I can't hear higher than about 14,000 hertz. Now, for radio use, you really only care about this range here because most of the information in the human voice is carried in the range below 5,000 hertz and even then most of it's not in the upper range. Most, I'd say 90% of it's below 2,500 hertz. So um, we can chop the bandwidth down a lot more with audio amplifiers used for receivers. Most of the stages for the like in a receiver, most of the lower level stages will be conducted with RC coupling. In other words, there will be a plate resistor that will develop the voltage and the capacitor will connect it to the next stage. They used to use transformers in the very early tube designs, but the tube designs that were, let's say, 1930s, they used them because capacitors were actually more expensive than coils and transformers at that time. Now we don't do that so much because transformers are larger, heavier, they cost more, and their frequency response is not as good. Although if you use a transformer coupled amplifier, you'll get better efficiency out of it because the tube's putting all of its power into the transformer. If you have an RC coupled amplifier, the tube's putting some of its power into that resistor, which turns into heat, which most people can't measure because it's a very small amount of heat, or it's putting it into the next tube stage, and the tube stage is gonna take that and amplify it, but you have a division of power there, so it's losing efficiency because it has to spread its power in more places. So, I've built a handful of audio power amplifiers. The transformers, for a simple receiver, it can be something as simple as like a wall, uh, not a wall, but a 12 volt transformer. Because the impedance ratio somewhat works for a tube amplifier for a small amount of power. The bandwidth on these isn't great. You get maybe 100. 150, 200 hertz at the bottom end to, a, to about 3,000 hertz on the top end. Um, they weren't designed to be used for audio, but we can use it for audio. Uh, the ones that are designed for hi-fi have a special winding in them 
they sort of crisscross the windings uh, between the primary and the secondary. Whereas on a power transformer, they just have primary in a big wad and secondary in a big wad, and they're all separated by a plastic block. And the interleaving of the windings causes the frequency response to extend all up into, some of them are quoted at 35,000 hertz. So, but they're also very expensive. I think they charge five, six hundred dollars a piece for them online. So unless you're one of those people that just absolutely has to have the best sound, you won't be buying one of those. Okay. Uh, so, here's my take on the audio situation. Two, my opinion is that tubes are simpler to work with. You don't have to do as much to get a tube amplifier working as you do a transistor amplifier. That's why I prefer working with tubes. Their parts are also more expensive and they're more dangerous. You have to work more around their uh, particular quirks, the heat, the voltage. Um, that can make solid state amplifiers, as it says here, they can make solid state amplifiers better than tube amplifiers because certain elements in the tube amplifiers limit the amount of distortion that you can get as an absolute bottom end, whereas a solid state amplifier doesn't have those same limitations. The problem is most people have never heard of these because consumer grade gear is meant to sell a lot of units at a low price, so they have to take shortcuts here and there. But that's with everything too. You have your radio equipment, you buy the lower dollar radios, you won't get the ex absolute best performance, but then again, I don't think many of us here can afford the $10,000, $15,000 radio receivers. So, um, because a tube works differently than a transistor, be it a JFET or a bipolar junction transistor, it has a different distortion pattern. If you run a sine wave into it that overdrives the tube stage, it's going to produce different levels of distortion. And when I say distortion, I mean harmonic distortion. Whereas, say, I put in a 1 kilohertz signal, you'll see some energy at 2 kilohertz, some at 3, some at 4, so on. Um, the amount of energy in the different frequencies of distortion is going to be less in some areas and more in other areas with a tube, and that causes the same signal to sound different. And the same distortion will measure as the same on a meter, but it'll sound different because it's grouped in different places. Um, the only real way to tell is to look on a spectrum analyzer, which will show your one kilohertz main tone, and then two kilohertz first harmonic, three kilohertz, four, so on. Um, some people like it, some people don't. It's really popular in guitar amplifiers because guitar aficionados can tell right away whether you're using a tube or a transistor amplifier. Next, please. So all of the radio receiver designs, including the ones that we use most often today, the super heterodyne receiver, they're all built around tubes. Reason being is the radio equipment before tubes was a spark gap transmitter and either a crystal detector or a coherer. Spark gap transmitter was basically a tank circuit hooked up to a big AC motor hooked up to an antenna. When you close the switch, it created a spark, and that spark created RF energy but it created RF energy everywhere. There was no bands. You didn't have 40 meters, 20 meters, so on. You had one band, and that was key down and key up because it created so much noise. And that's why those transmitters are either highly discouraged or illegal today because they just create so much noise. It's like splat, splat, splat. So they had a coherer, which was on the other end. This was a receiving device. A little glass tube filled with iron filings. When it received RF energy, the iron filings all stuck together, created what was close to a short circuit. Hooked up to a motor that had this big thing that clicked. So when it received the Morse code energy, it would make this thing click, and you would hear on the other end Morse code. And then they also had something that vibrated the iron filings so they would come loose, because the iron filings wouldn't come loose by themselves. They would just stick together because they're magnetized. Um, invented the vacuum tube and the vacuum tube was able to actually take a weak signal and amplify it. And not only was it able to take a weak signal and amplify it, they could run it through a crystal detector, turn it into audio, then amplify it again, and drive a speaker. Or you see the old horns on the phonographs. Um, most amateurs start out with the one tube regenerative receiver because that's a very simple design. People still build those today. I built 100 of them. Um, Basically because the grid of the tube doesn't draw any current from the circuit that's loading it. You can have a resonant circuit there, tune across the band, and that tube is not going to draw power from that. Do you have a question? Someone, oh, I saw someone raising their hand back there, so. 
Um, let's see. What that does is because it does not draw power from that tuned circuit, that tuned circuit is still going to act sharp as if there's no load on it at all. So you'll get very much higher tuning from a tube uh, receiver than you will from a transistor receiver or a diode receiver. Um, again, they invented the regenerative receiver, which is basically a tube that amplifies the signal and feeds its own output back to itself. And what that'll do is it'll cause it to increase gain over a million times or so. And you can hear weak signals just by tuning across the band and listening to it squeal and squeak and so forth as it uh, amplifies itself. Then they built super heterodyne receivers, which changes the frequency coming in to one frequency, amplifies it through a very tight filter, and then turns into audio. Uh, this was all done by Edwin Armstrong, and it was done in the 20s and 30s. I got a book at home that was written in 1929, and it talks about this new receiver that the hams were using to call the super head. Yes. <laughs> I've got a, I think it's Ralph Terman, Radio Engineering, written in 1932, and it has Nothing about solid state, all trans, uh, all tubes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, the All American Five was a radio that everyone here has probably seen at some point. Little plastic or maybe even wood radios contained five tubes, uh, no transformer, and hooked up right to the line, um, the AC line, uh, and all the filaments were connected in series. And all the filaments added up to 110 volts. So. It was like one big series circuit, and they would all heat up at the same time. Um, had a mixer, had a IF amplifier, a detector, a power amplifier, and a rectifier tube. Those are the five tubes. That's why they called it All American Five. The reason it was a potentially deadly radio was because the AC line was often connected right to the case. So when you turn the radio on, and you touch the case, and you touch something that was grounded, you'd become part of that circuit, and you'd probably shock yourself. So in the later ones, they actually isolated the AC voltage from the chassis, but it was isolated through a capacitor and a resistor. If either one of those components failed, it was still a death trap. So if you're ever working on one of those, which I'm sure some people in here have or want to, uh, get an isolation transformer. Big, bulky transformer, be able to pass the current through there, but it won't be connected to ground. So if you touch the radio and then you touch the sink, there won't be a path because that radio is not referenced to ground. I still wouldn't touch it anyway. It takes all the fun out of life when you put it through an isolation transformer. Yes. And these are back before the days of polarized power plugs. Yes. So you could, if you plugged it in one way, you'd be okay. If you plugged it in upside down. Yep. Depending on what the switch was. Because they always put the switch in the negative ground, in the, the neutral line. Yep. So if you turn it on, the chassis was hot when it was on. If you turn it off, the chassis was hot when it was off. Yeah. They were fun. <laughs> Didn't bother, 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 bother. I never got affected by them. I used to know an aircraft electrician who would test for uh, power on a plane, look his fingers and stick them up in the airplane and see if there was power. Well, electricians, regular electricians used to do that. Yep. Uh, a lot of my old mentors from uh, my tube group online, they say that they're saying it's like they were more immune to electricity back then or it didn't affect them as much, which I think is true because Human body resistance is only low enough to be a serious danger in certain situations, but as a catch-all, they just tell everyone to avoid it because it's hard to tell when your resistance is low enough to cause you serious damage by the power line. So, again, tube receivers are bulky. They contain heavy metal chassis, tuning elements. I've got a tube and stone receiver that I've been working on for the past couple of years, and it's about 19 inches high and what, 14 inches wide. And the capacitor is much, much larger than a regular tuning capacitor, like the one that's sitting over there in that bin. I think everyone here has seen it. Um, and there's eight tubes, and they're about the size of Coke bottles. So tube receivers, tube equipment in general, is not meant for compactness and portability. It can be done, but it's not meant for it. Plus, because there's so many con uh, special construction parts, they cost a lot more. Um, back in the day when tubes were still being manufactured, you could buy them in bins at the store. You could get this stuff cheap on magazines all the time because they were made for tube receivers. Now that everything's miniaturized, uh, transistors, solid uh, surface mount devices, it's very, very hard to get this old stuff that's mechanical and 
um, meant for design with tubes. And that's a pain because a lot of this stuff is easier to use in design with. Um, people still build AM, FM, short weave amateur receivers with tubes. You know, it's a nostalgia factor, it's fun, it's something that you can actually do. It's hard to make a circuit board in your garage that has SMT components splatter all over it, whereas more people can take a drill press, drill into a chassis, put it in tube sockets, solder some wires in, and have a radio receiver that'll output signals from the air. Next, please. Okay. So, with normal transistors and normal circuitry, you can get about 200 watts at a transmitter. That's without resorting to special circuitry, special safety devices, big banks of transistors. Um, I've seen RF transistors that can put out 100 watts per pair, but the problem with those is they cost about $50 a piece. So it's going to be expensive no matter what. Then you have to heat sink them. Then you have to um, protect them from SWR and so forth. If you hook up a single 813 to a transmitting circuit and give it the right voltage and current, it can give you about, I think, 75 to 150 watts by itself, just one 813. Um, and it's a lot less complicated because instead of having a complicated matching network, ferrite blocks, um, you just have a pi network, two capacitors and an inductor that you can switch to tune the tube stage to a load. And the pi network also acts as a filter because when you tune that tube stage to the load it tunes it for that frequency only so higher frequencies whether it be radi uh, spurious radiation would be I don't want to say eliminated but it quenches them somewhat just because of the way it's designed um, some of the higher power tubes like four 1000 a uh, a bank of three 500s uh, they can generate the legal limit with a few tubes the trade-off is that you have to build a power supply for it that's capable of putting out 2,000, 3,000 volts, which if you're careful and you're ready to do that project, you will put it in a case that is going to protect the user from those voltages. Because you're not going to just well, put it on a big piece of plywood where the wires are exposed. It's 3,000 volts, and when you touch 3,000 volts, there is no second chance. Next, please. Okay. The older technology just used a single tank. Uh, in the plate of the final, there'd be a big coil made of big heavy gauge wire, and there'd be a capacitor across it. And on that coil, there'd be a link, which would be another couple of turns not connected to the wire. And that would take the energy radiating in that tank and drive the antenna with it. Um, the way to tune these is you'd sit there and watch the current meter for the final amplifier, and you'd tune that capacitor until you saw the current dip. And when the current dipped, that you knew the tank was at resonance on your transmitting frequency because when it's at resonance, it's at, the high, it's, it's at its highest impedance point. It's taking the least power possible from the circuit, and so that tube has a conduct less to drive the power output. They usually put a little lamp near the tank, and just the energy radiating from the tank would light up the lamp, and that was a good indicator of your power. Um, what I did is I got a little needle current meter I think it was a 50 microameter, put it in a box, put a short string wire to it, and a small diode and capacitor across it. And what that does is it makes it a crude field strength meter. So when I key down, I can tweak my transmitter until I see that meter peak. That means I'm putting out the most RF possible. Um, the newer designs, everything I've seen that was made in, let's say, 1950 onward, from what I've studied, uses a Pi or Pi L. It's a series inductor and a capacitor tuned to the plate and a capacitor tuned to the antenna. And what that does is it changes the 50 ohm antenna impedance into something like three or four or five thousand ohms that the pl uh, plates of the tubes are more comfortable seeing. The plate resistance of the tubes, which I mentioned earlier, also has to do with the loads that the tubes like to see. And because of this, they don't like to see 50 ohm loads. They wouldn't be able to put much power in there. It's more comfortable seeing a higher load. You can put a higher voltage into less current and then its maximum power will go out to that antenna. Next, please. Okay, so I found on the internet a guide from QST which showed that you could use receiving tubes for low power transmitters. Tubes like 6V6, 6L6, um, 2E26, 6CL6, and so forth. Uh, they could be used 
as transmitters and lower power radios because they're, although they're meant for audio, they could still be used up to, say, 20 or 30 megahertz. Um, most of my work has been undone on 14 megahertz, but I've played around a bit on 7. Um, once you get up to 10 meters, 10 meters was at one time considered UHF, so you have to take a little more care in designing the circuits for 10 meters than you would for 80 or 40 meters. Just because the frequency is higher, it leaches over more easily, um, there's a lot more losses. A lot of ham transmitters, including my FT-101, use sweep tubes. These are high power tubes that were used in TVs to control the movement of the beam across the TV screen. And they're designed to where the plate will charge to a lower voltage, like say 200 volts by 600, but it'll still have an appreciable amount of current. So tubes like 6DQ6, 6JS6, 6CU5, things like those can make appreciable transmitters. I have a handful of them at home in a shoebox I've been waiting to make a transmitter with. Um, the thing is, at one time they were all manufactured in bulk because of the TV industry and having to replace tubes in the TV. Now they're not because TVs don't use sweep tubes anymore. And because amateurs and, and CBers and so forth have been using them in transmitters, their supplies are somewhat dried up. So they're more in demand right now because they're harder to get because all the good, good ones have been used. Next, please. Okay. Usually when you go to the 50 to 200 watt level, you're not working with one tube anymore unless it's a larger tube. Most of the transmitters I've seen in this power class use a pair of tubes, like a pair of 6146 Bravos, uh, 829, 811, 813, 465. Um, these tubes get hotter, that sometimes they have a, need to have a fan on them to blow the heat <coughs> off the glass envelopes. Um, when you put two tubes in parallel, that effectively produces the same power as double what the single tube would. What you have to remember is when you put two tubes in parallel, you have to take the load impedance that that tube would normally see and cut it in half. For example, uh, a 2E26 tube, which is a low power VHF tube amplifier, it likes to see a load of 4,500 ohms. So if I were to use two in parallel, I would want to use 2,250 ohms for the load. And it's not an actual resistor. That's values of capacitors and inductors that will simulate that value when I hooked it up to a 50 ohm impedance on the antenna. Uh, I have seen some transmitters that will take four, six, or eight tubes, um, again with the sweep tubes, but they create a high power transmitter that way. It's theoretically impossible, to, or theoretically possible to do this with any tube, but there's a logical limit to it. Won't you, any question? Is it possible for you to real briefly and simply explain what you mean with the push-pull? Okay. Push-pull is when you have two tubes that aren't in parallel. Um, in audio amplifiers, you see this a lot. And in transistor RF amplifiers, you see this a lot. I haven't seen too many circuits with tubes that do this, just because it's harder to match up to a Pi network, although it is possible. You have a transformer that's got two windings, and there's a tap in the center. Voltage goes to the tap, and each of the ends of the windings will go to the plates of the tubes. And the tubes are fed out of phase. Like you'll have another transformer in the grids, and they'll feed them out of phase. So when one tube's conducting hard, the other one's off. And so each half of the transformer sees RF at one time and combines it so there's more power in the output than there would be. And that puts less of a demand on each tube because it has time to be off, and that plate gets to be a little cooler than it would be as if it were running hard all the time. Thank you. So it's just a phase switching situation? Not really. It's a gimmick that gets more power out of the same type of tube and also better efficiency because it can run the tubes cooler. Because that's very common in high power audio amplifiers. If you go see a tube guitar amplifier, it's almost always push pull unless it uses a weird transmitting tube for the output. But once you get in this level, you're going to see higher plate voltages because it's required. You're going to have the lower current in the tube, but you're going to have to have the higher plate voltage to get out the same amount of power. Okay. Um, at the higher power level, the QROO power level, you'll have three 500Zs, four 400As, four 1000s, eight 33s, eight 13s, what they call fishbowl tubes because they look like a fishbowl. So, um, 
I've seen pictures of old AM transmitters that's the size of a refrigerator. They'll have a deck with the transmitter on it. They'll have another deck with the modulator. And they'll have another deck with the power supply. The modulator is an audio amplifier that will generate something like 500 watts because you have to put a ridiculous amount of audio power into that carrier to get maximum modulation and to be actually heard. Um, that's why AM is not used a lot anymore in favor of sideband because AM is much less efficient than sideband. It takes a lot more circuitry. It takes a lot more electrical power to do. People still use AM. It's just not as used as much. Um, when you have transmitters of this power, you'll get up in the 3,000 volt power range for the supply. And you'll have to use unorthodox methods of building the high voltage. You'll have ceramic standoffs that are four inches high where the high voltage connects to. You'll have silicon wire that not the, the wire isn't silicon, but the insulation is, and it's rated to 6,000 volts, 7,000 volts more, because you need that much isolation. Um, there's usually safety interlocks on the chassis, so where when you open it, the power can't be applied. Um, so, linear amplifiers that work for CW and SSB, um, they don't have to have that big modulator deck, and they don't have to have all that ridiculously expensive power supply components because the modulation is done in a different way and it makes better use of the electrical power it's given. So you'll see a linear amplifier that might be the size of a microwave. It'll have a couple of you know, fishbowl tubes in there, but it won't take up a whole refrigerator sized space in your ham shack. Um, with my FT101EE, they sold a companion linear that used a couple of tetrodes for 1,000 watts, I believe, and it was about the size of a large microwave, about maybe 24 inches wide by 18 inches high. A big box, but not as big as a refrigerator. And a lot of times when people build stuff like this, they build it themselves rather than buy it. Although they still don't buy it. Uh, so um, that's when you'll get in the area of having to cool the tubes with a fan in order to keep the glass cool so it doesn't rupture or so it doesn't leak at the seals. Um, a lot of them is just when you turn on the filament, the tube will get so hot by itself that you don't even have to turn on the plate supply and it'll get hot enough to rupture the glass. Next, please. Okay, so tubes in general, but especially transmitting tubes, are fragile mechanically. It's a glass envelope. If you drop it, if you hit it with something hard, if you fall on, something falls on it, then it could damage the tube. Um, it's a lot more substantial in electrical situations because a transistor is a tiny silicon chip on a die. And the tiny silicon chip doesn't have as much thermal inertia as the huge metal plate inside the tube. So a momentary overload might drive that silicon die to five, six hundred degrees in a second and kill it. Your transistor's dead. But if you have a tube, it takes that much more power to turn that plate into a higher temperature. So the tube can survive more overloads. I'm not saying that tubes are immune to SWR and other overloads, because they're not, but when you overdrive a tube, instead of melting the silicon dye, sometimes the elements inside will arc over, which may or may not destroy the tube. So if it's a momentary thing, you hear the little clicking once, and then you automatically take the key off, and you investigate the problem, it's possible that your tube could still be good. But usually once the transistors have seen a side of damage, they don't survive, and there's nothing you can do except replace the whole transistor bank. Um, the good thing about tube transmitters, though, is they all tune into the load. You have that capacitor and sometimes inductor switch you can use to tune it. So if there's a mismatch between the antenna, sometimes you can mitigate it by trying to tune it and seeing how, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? adjusting for the mismatch, whereas in a transistor you have to use an external tuner to tune the antenna because the transistor amplifiers usually just have a big ferrite block which matches the transistors to the output and that's it. Next please. Suppose that's it. This is a transmitter made of four 833A tubes. Uh, by itself it's capable of three to five hundred watts of RF power in a bank of four of them. They'll probably use these two as the RF amplifier, these two as the modulator. Um, these metal 
rods right here connect to the two electrodes and they have fins on them that act as heat sinks so it draws the heat out of the tube in a way because the tube operates on heat but if it operates on too much heat it will mechanically fail so you have to manage the heat with the tube so questions comments rotten tomatoes complaints <laughs> yes what is the availability of tubes other than the high output transmitting tubes these days? There are plenty of sites that sell vacuum tubes. Um, if you go on eBay and type in vacuum tube lot, you can find boxes of old tubes from a radio repairman's stash that either they pass away or they retire or they just want to sell their tubes because they're taking up space and get just a grab bag of tubes. There are sites online that sell tubes that are known as new old stock because in the 50s and 60s, the tubes were at the peak of their technology, and the transistor was invented in the course of a few years, tubes were obsolete. So there's many, many new old stock tubes that were manufactured and never used. They're new in their box. And tubes do expire with use because the filament will only last so long. It's just like a light bulb. But the shelf life of the tubes is indefinite. It's a glass bottle with metal parts inside. So if you don't use the tube, theoretically they could last forever. I've opened up tubes that were, or boxes of tubes that were 60 years old, looked inside and the copper contacts inside the tube were still bright and shiny and new. They don't have air to oxidize them, so there's nothing that can get inside the tube and corrupt the parts. Um, there's websites that sell new old stock tubes and there are some websites that sell brand new tubes. Mainly the tubes that are made today are audio tubes, 12AX7, 12AU7, EL34. There are some radio tubes that are still being built, 811 Alpha, uh, 6146, 813. There are a handful of lower level transmitting tubes and receiving tubes still being made. All the audio tubes ever made are classified as receiving tubes because receivers have audio amplifiers. Although they can be used as transmitting tubes, they weren't designed for transmitting tubes. I heard Russian tubes, or that they still make new tubes in Russia. Yes, there is a reflector plant in Russia, that's, it's called Reflector, and they manufacture tubes for several different brands. Um, what the difference in brands are is kind of subjective. I mean, you might feel a certain way about the tubes labeled Tungsol, he might feel the same way about the tubes labeled JJ Tesla, so forth. Um, it's just based on your personal experience. There's not really any, I haven't really seen any studies based on the uh, preference of these tubes. Um, some people say that the new old stock American tubes perform a lot better than the new ones because they aren't made to the same standard of quality. Like especially in a high power amplifier where you're going to run them outside of their ratings. A lot of people run tubes outside of their ratings. Um, tubes will have a maximum plate voltage, a maximum plate current, and so forth. Um, a lot of people treat them as guidelines and they'll run them outside of their ratings to get more power out of them. Usually that shortens the tube life. But if you have a stock of 20 tubes, you may not care. I've heard that uh, soap tech tubes are highly regarded. Mm -hmm. Any comment on that? I haven't actually used any soft tech tubes. Most of the vacuum tubes that I've used in my designs that were brand new uh, were of the brand Electro Harmonics. But as far as I can tell, they're all made in the same factory. Um, Are they Chinese? I, uh, I haven't ever used a Chinese tube. But um, I've never had a tube fail on me either. Well, I, let me take that back. I haven't had an audio tube fail on me. The tubes that I've had that were failed were in AEA5 radios, because I have a couple of them sitting around. And their failure mechanism is that <coughs> since the filaments are all in series, they all receive a huge jolt of current when they're cold. And when they warm up, the current goes down to them. And because they're in series, each one doesn't receive an equal amount of power to them. So when you turn that radio on, every now and then one of those filaments just ruptures and the whole radio is dead because it's like a string of Christmas lights. And none of the tubes can light up because that one filament is broken. And it's just a matter of electrical stress on the tubes. As for audio tubes, I've never had a tube fail or you know, wear out. Yes? I've replaced thousands of tubes 
thousands. Yes, tubes had to be replaced. To run two or three radio repair shops. Okay. <laughs> and they wear out. One of the most common, because I'm on a group online called Fun With Tubes, and we talk about tubes all the time, but one of the most common practices for tube troubleshooting is make sure all the tubes are good. And usually it's the more high power tubes, like the power amplifier, which drives the speaker, and the rectifier tube, because they handle the most power and have the most thermal cycling. Because tubes get hot, get hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold, it causes the materials to expand and contract. Eventually they start to develop fractures, and eventually they just break. If we have structural engineers in here, or construction people, um, it's the same thing with concrete. You know, the sun shines on the concrete, it expands, it contracts, you'll develop cracks in it. Um, but in the radio, you, usually you see darkened spots in the radio where the power tubes were. The, it was a 50C5 or 50L6, and there's a 35W4 and 35Z5, which are the power amplifier and rectifier tubes. And those take the most of the heat. So do you build your tube amplifiers with soft start to regulate the current inflow current when you turn them on? Most tube amplifiers don't have the amount of inflow current when they turn on as transistor amplifiers. The reason being is transistor amplifiers usually use a huge bank of capacitors for their DC power supplies. And that's because the voltage is a lot lower, so to get the same amount of power they have to up the current. When they have to up the current, they have to have a huge, a larger filter capacitor bank to smooth out that voltage. So when you switch on a transistor amplifier, those capacitors are not charged, and it looks like a short to the transformer at the first moment of turn on. And that's why when you turn on the stereo, the lights will sometimes dim. Tube amplifiers have capacitors that take more voltage than current, and they usually have a lower capacitance. I have never seen a 4,000 microfarad capacitor rated at 500 volts. I'm sure they exist, but I've never seen one. Um, when the tube amplifier is turned on, all the tubes are cold. So when the tungsten filaments see that current, they see it for a brief second, and then they start to warm up, and there's no more, uh, it's, I don't want to say there's no more high current, but the current's at a more manageable level because the filaments are all warm. Sometimes you can put a series resistor in with the filaments, and that'll adjust the voltage to the filaments, but it'll also control the current a bit, because that series resistor doesn't have a changing resistance, so the current that goes into those cold tungsten filaments will be limited by that. As there, there were some amplifiers built back in those days that had a off, standby, on, oh, yes. and, and ready. Mm -hmm. And when you went to the standby position, they routed the filament voltage through a resistor. Yes. And reduced the current and allowed the tubes to yes. warm up at a lower current okay, rate. Okay, so that's what you're talking about. And then, then when you go to the on position and full mm -hmm. filament, and when you went to the operate position, yes. you applied the plate voltage. Yes. The uh, last amplifier I built was a guitar amplifier. That's the one where I got the 400 volts by. Um, I built the standby switch that prevented the high voltage from being applied to the tubes until they were warmed up because then the plates wouldn't have a high voltage condition on them when there was no current available for being drawn. Um, a lot of lower end equipment has them or doesn't have soft start stuff like that. There are some people who build their tube amplifiers and they'll have a 30 second relay control on their supply voltages so they flip on the switch and a microprocessor or complicated transistor network will slowly ramp up the filament voltage from say 1 volt to 6.3 volts over a time of 30 seconds. Just like slow, a slow turning of the knob to raise the voltage up. Then once that happens it'll trigger a second relay trigger which will ramp up the high voltage from say 50 volts to 400 volts over the course of 30 seconds and it'll do the same thing. <coughs> These generally happen when the guys spend three or four hundred dollars on a set of output tubes and don't want them ever to blow up. But most of the electronics that I built with tubes hasn't had anything more than a series resistor in the filaments. And that's just to, it's more to drop the extra voltage than anything else. Because every tube has a filament with a rated voltage for operation. And if you operate it lower, the tube will last longer if you get more power. But if you operate it higher, the tube won't last as long. And every time I've built one, the transformer voltage is just a bit high. 
let's say it's 6.7 volts instead of 6.3. So I'll put a small resistance in there that drops just enough voltage to where it's within specs. Any more questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.